it right? Good morning again. So should we ask ChatGPT for the answers or should we have a discussion? As you want. We can do both and compare. Okay. <laughs> good point. So good morning once again. Great panel. So uh, the title of that panel is on learning and relearning for continuing pharma's next transformation momentum. I think it's a very important topic and during this particular opening panel we should set the stage and kick off the stage for the further discussions. Four incredible speakers. Uh, so let's start first with Davidek, since you're last there. Davidek, how are you doing? That's your third next, right? Yes, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Davidek Karen here, Global Head of Digital for Roche. I will set context for this panel. I'll be taking my corporate hat off and, and keeping it somewhat real because uh, I think there's some good conversations we would love to kick off this conference with um, to really create some provocativeness, but also some, some real talk. Um, but with that said, we do have an amazing uh, panel later today with both Oz and Erica from Genentech that we will put my Roche pack hat back on and, and talk about. So thank, thank you, David. Camila? Well, it's great to be here for the first time. I know you tried a couple of times to get me here, but I finally arrived. Um, I'm looking forward to listening to what everybody else has to say today. But I'm also looking forward to talking to all of you about women's health because it's way more important than what you think. But for this opening session, it's really what it's all generally about in the pharma industry. And I think it's really exciting, your questions, and I'm looking forward to answering them later. Thank you, Camila. Katarina? Thank you. It's also my first time here. I brought my uh, suitcase full of bikinis and uh, flip-flops. <laughs> I will throw it away, <laughs> at least for this time. Hopefully next year, I'll see Sunny Dubrovnik. Um, so I'm currently the Region Europe Executive Director, um, Medical Executive Director. Uh, very happy to be here to learn from my colleagues in the panel and hopefully, you know, being very provocative but also tangible with you. Hopefully you like it. Thank you, Katrina. And Herod, your second time? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. It is my second time, actually. I was with you, Dario, on the first Next Summit uh, here in Dubrovnik and I would remind you that it was also raining then. Uh, you know, a few years ago. So next time we won't uh, invite you. Exactly. I think it's me. <laughs> I think it's me. But, but really thrilled to be back and even more thrilled to see how much Dex Pharma has grown. Uh, the first meeting, I don't think it was a room this big. Uh, so congratulations for you and the team for really making this a very sustainable um, environment where we can exchange ideas. Uh, just like what David Dick says, also uh, for me as a U.S. publicly traded biotech, Leader, it is important that I make the disclaimer that all the opinions are my own. It's not my company's, so, so that's, that's really important to, to you know, get that up front. You know, having said that, I'm really looking forward to the conversations, not only in the opening session, but really uh, over the next uh, you know, course, because at the end of the day, as you said, you gave us the recipe in your opening, but uh, as we know, the recipe is one thing. Um, if everybody follows the recipe, then we wouldn't need to be you know, doing what we're doing. So it's all about the people, it's all about the connectivity and how do we actually leverage the technology. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, Hart. So let's start with the first question and with you, Katerina, because actually that question was proposed for you, which uh, I really <laughs> like. So and this is what are the current transformation needs, a bold need in pharma, and from which perspective of commercial and medical affairs uh, should we start when we speak about those needs? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I was hearing your opening and I continuously hear about medical and commercial and about HCP and customer engagement and experience. And I think from my personal perspective and now being a little bit provocative, I don't think that medical affairs and commercial have different transformational needs. I think in general, pharma needs a common transformation. Um, the world is changing very fast. I know we are working pharma specifically in a pretty resilient industry with cargoes growing still 6%, 12% in, in some areas until the end of the decade. But like the Game of Thrones, you were talking about Harry Potter, I talk about <coughs> Game of Thrones, there are quite a lot of threatening waves and threats coming in our way. One of them is because of the huge patent cliff coming huge and precedent, companies are putting a lot, a lot of pressure on successful launchings. We all feel this every day. 
we need to be super successful at launching. Medical and commercial, the organizations. At the same time, we have more and more players coming in to the launching field. We have many companies in the past two years investing in the same disease areas. So we have areas like oncology, cell and gene, rare diseases, where the competition is tremendous, tremendous. We have a lot of new players, but we have a system where, I mean, HCPs or in Europe, a lot of other decision makers who have limited time to be with us. So I don't think we are transforming as fast as we should. I think we should look at threats or at least we should maybe start transforming while the ocean is still flat and before the storm comes. And I think the transformation needs are about our operational level, our operational uh, structure and the way we do operations, but also technology. Not technology in front of the customer, but I'm a true believer that technology in the back office to, to take better decisions, integrate better data, and have a more robust, way more robust, patient customer journey will really, really help us to build the future. future. And, and being in a wave of permanent change and not change now. Do a small pilot, do a small change. No, on a permanent changing mode. And I think machines can actually help us very deeply do that. I don't think we are doing that yet. Good points. Herod, let's continue with you. Yeah, look, we're an innovation-based uh, business. That's what we are. So we either innovate or we die. You know, it's pretty brutal and pretty true. And that applies to the major, you know, different sectors within, within our healthcare industry. So if you're in a biotech world, um, you know, especially pre-commercial, which, you know, which is where my experience is now, after 27 years of pharma, where, you know, I enjoyed all the ups and downs, but fundamentally, one area, for example, I didn't know about was financing. Because, to be honest, you know, when you're a commercial company, you get, uh, you, get uh, you know, bad years, it goes a bit down, but, you know, money is coming in. Well, you're a pretty commercial company now. I have a whole other set of respect for a lot of the vendors, a lot of the hustlers, you know, really trying to, to make it. So on an innovation level, you know, biotechs are really in a difficult situation when it comes to the um, access to capital. Uh, to Katrina's point on the pharma side, you know, the, 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 these cliffs that we look at and some of the multi-billion dollar gaps that we look at is, is uh, quite uh, awning. Um, and then you look at, you know, VC-backed companies, PE-backed companies, a lot of, you know, biotechs, um, you, you need to sell to pharma. Pharma needs to prune out assets to uh, PE-based companies. So, this whole sector has to continue to move, and the only way you can do that is by continuously innovating more and more and by making sure that those customer experiences are really good. Because it doesn't matter where the breakdown happens. At the end of the day, the customer doesn't say, oh, you know, my experience with medical was very good, with commercial wasn't good, so I'm going to be, get, you know, they're like, this is not working for me. And they're going to kind of say, you know, fix it somehow. So the onus is on us to really you know, make this full circle happen. And the, the thinking of, well, the problem is not in my department, it's somewhere else. Th that really needs to be relooked and unlearned and then relearned again. And how do you unlearn something where you're actually not incentivized to mm. unlearn? You're incentivized to keep that momentum that you have every year. I think that's kind of one of the things uh, hopefully we can grapple with in the next couple of days that we can come up with new ways to, to deal with the entire customer experience. So with a biotech startup, you're changing and learning on a daily basis, I suppose. Well, we have to, or else we die. I mean, that's, it's very simple. Um, you, you know, I always looked at biotech when I was in pharma in a different way in the years 2015, 2016, when there was good access to capital. Until 2020, you'll have companies coming in biotech with, you know, let's say, you know, less than uh, level A data, with multi-hundred million dollar uh, IPOs uh, going to the marketplace, those days are, are pretty much gone. Now, what's the latest cash? They're, they're, you know, if you take cell and gene therapy, for example, there's 220 companies or so. You know, then you know, the provocative question is, do you really need 220 companies to be going after similar things? Maybe some amalgamation, maybe some partnership of, of tools is, is not a bad thing. So, yeah, I mean, in, in biotech, it's much more brutal because it's either, you know, it's a high stakes game. It's high rewards, but, you know, your, your natural way is destined to failure. 
That's what 80% of the biotechs would do. Mm. Not because they have bad ideas, it's because they run out of, out of cash. So you, you know, now, we're, we're, you know, from my vantage points, that kind of has become the real biggest thing on my plate to say, how do we ensure we give the technology that we really love its place in the sun mm. by making sure that we have enough of a, of a drive to get there? So that's what we're doing. Thank you, Harold. Yeah. David, do you mind if I build on that? Because I put myself, if I was in the audience, I'm like, all right, great, but what does that mean? So if you think about the separation between medical, commercial, et cetera, but let's put ourselves almost in the patient's shoes and just the <laughs> trends that we're seeing within pharma, right? Right now, there's been so much effort put around precision medicine, and we all understand that, but what does that actually mean? So for example, with the genomic testing on the diagnostic side, let's say woman's health, for their breast cancer, what out of five patients has potentially her two inceptors, right? And there's, we have medicine now that actually can target that. But then from a commercial side, how do we actually go to market and make sure that's available for that one out of five women who have that is where I think we play a critical role. So I know we talk about competitiveness and better marketing and performance marketing and all that, but put yourself in the patients and caregivers' shoes. Like there's people out there that, guys, if you don't do your job right, they're not gonna get access to that potentially, which means they're not gonna show up to a graduation or wedding. I think that's the reality check. I think all of us in this room and our, and our peers within our companies need to understand that, yes, the shareholders, the stakeholders that, that run our companies, but if we do this right, people will benefit, but then also we need to change how we currently do things. And hopefully throughout this conference, we understand that, yes, I mean, you can put the best go-to-market strategy in place. There's great performance marketing. There's good tactics around different channels, but it's not about that. It's about what is your company's stance? What is your position, even within a disease area, and how you as catalysts can help create movements within your company. So it's actually not even about digital or, or transformation. It's about leading people through change, right? And I think you said it really nicely before, that the, the ecosystem is drastically changing, but our companies are not as fast. So I think, again, I don't have the answer. If I had the answer, I wouldn't be here on stage. But I think we all have to look internally and understand, all right, what is it that we need to do to really move this forward? And if you do that right, you'll be able to launch more products at scale. You'll be able to really help the women's movement that's going on. You'll be able to do all those things. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to stop talking about the up top and really look deeper and be more pragmatic about exactly what are we trying to do. But also within your companies, really paint that vision on where we need to be by X date as well and realistic. And th within that, everything will flow. Thanks, so sorry, that. I just put myself in the shoes. I'm like, what does all this mean, right? So to build on what you just said, um, no matter what question you ask, I will always come back to saying it's about people and culture. Yep. And I've been working in some phenomenal companies where we actually had a head of culture in the executive committee. That was a real sign that the CEO of this rare disease company focused on culture before anything else, and that was collaboration and patient focus and all of this. Recently, I've been working in a private equity-owned company. There is not a single head of culture in that company, right? So you have a very different way of working. And both can be good, but I saw way more transformation in a company where the CEO and the executive leadership team are measured on the culture that they get people to work for and with, and where they ask people to be either the representative or the culture, or to actually build the culture themselves, and then the executive committee to take that on. And um, the second point I'm just gonna make around that is then also, what are the new people we're bringing into our organizations? Because we're always talking about retention and how do we keep all the great people. I think you really build a phenomenal transformational collaborative culture. If you have the courage to bring in very new thinking people from areas that we're not used to having in the pharmaceutical industry. I'm like a dinosaur. I've been in the industry for 27 years. Actually, basically, I don't think anyone should hire me anymore, but they keep hiring me to into these great roles, and I'm very happy about that. But I'm not sure that I am actually the one that are bringing new thoughts. But hopefully what I'm bringing is the openness to listen to the new people I bring in and who will then help us really driving a transformation, but from the heart, from the culture, and then obviously to the customers and to the patients. Mm, thanks a lot, Camila. Next question, I mean, we all know that transformation and change is the constant, and it always happens. I mean, we, we don't need to change in the last three years, we have to change since ever, right? Uh, my next question would be, what would be the foundation of a healthy, new commercial medical affairs ecosystem in pharma? So what are the foundations? Uh, maybe we can build on that cultural aspect on the human side, because frankly speaking, I think that everything starts with that, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all the greatest brands who deliver proper experience build on that. 
right? Yeah. If you go to Starbucks, I mean, you receive almost everywhere the same service, right? Mm -hmm. So, but they are different people, but they are having the same culture. Maybe we can start with you, Camilla. I just think the key is that we don't look at what our titles are and which function that we are in. And one of the best examples I have is, obviously it has to start with where we focus on the patient and therefore our prescriber and what surrounds that prescriber. And you just build the right team from the company that will surround that prescriber to be the best possible prescriber so that they can do the best for the patients. And we, obviously everybody has titles and they come from functions, but we would then look at what is the task with this prescriber ahead of us or in front of us and who is then the part of this team who should lead the task? And whether that was medical affairs, or commercial, or digital, or actually the patient advocacy head, it didn't matter. It would be the one that would be the f where the task would be the focus for. And that meant that we were circulating the leadership of all the tasks we had to do to make that prescriber engage with the company. And I think that's when you break down barriers on, sometimes commercial is always looked as the place to be sometimes, because sometimes we have the biggest titles and we get the most focus, but when you break down those barriers and you circulate the leadership between all functions, it's not about your function, it's about what you do in front of that customer and then everybody wins. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe Harold, you can speak about, uh, we have an interesting discussion that actually the table at Pharma got bigger, right? <laughs> Which maybe is an issue. So can you speak about that, please? Yeah, I mean, Dario and I were speaking about this. And, and one thing which is, I think if we step back, the model, of really making sure that our customers are getting the, the experience is, is just getting more complex. I mean, back in the day, um, you know, it may be even more in the pharma world. It's now, now it's my 31st year this year. Um, it, it used to be much simpler. You had two people, usually the commercial person, and then, oh, we need one of those medicals, right? I mean, that's kind of how the thinking was back in the day and you will sit around the table and then it will be a much smaller conversation. And then as things became more and more complex, as more and more stakeholders were raising their hands, the payer was saying, what about me? I need to make a, I have a say in this. Then, you know, market access became a, 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 an important emerging, uh, you know, discipline. Then we needed market access people on the table. And at one point we were like, oh, it's all about patient centricity. So we needed the patient centricity person on the table. We needed the, this voice on the table. We need that voice. So at one point, as I was saying to Dario, we needed to buy a bigger table in the conference room because now it's no longer the two, three people who are there. Now you need 30 people because this person has to look at from this. And it's not a bad thing by itself. We just need to recognize that that takes a much more exponential dialogue than what it used to be. Yeah. So we got to be committed to go through that if we just increase our dialogue just by a bit, we actually are not doing ourselves a favor because it does takes much more of a dialogue when you have these many people. And then I would I actually push back every time when in, in my previous companies where we would say, oh, now it's all about the uh, digital and all about the patient. And then we will actually put somebody in charge of this, of culture and all that. I actually have a, you know, more of a reserved view about that because I think if something is important, to Camilla's point, it really has to start from the top. That leadership team really has to, to embody patient centricity, for example. We can't just be delegating patient centricity to one person in a company. That's an impossible task. You can put somebody who actually is really pushing us all to be do, doing the thinking, but if the, you know, the top is not living it every day, then that's a very impossible role. And the same thing with digital, we, we see in many companies, sometimes people come from non-pharma uh, organizations, but then, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, right? So why is that? That becomes a very important thing. We really need to make sure that we're having enough enrollment conversations for the customer experience to really emerge because we're as good as our weakest link within that environment. To, and to build on that, right? So, right when you said, and I rightfully so, there's so many chairs at the table now, but the reality is if you look at even the last six, seven years, those people sitting at the table have not invested in themselves to be the best version, right? So for example, on access, we're leaving so much money on the table because we're not looking at customer experience in areas like that. Mm -hmm. So I think from a culture perspective, to even take it up another level when you, when you mentioned around people, you want people around that table that say, hey, listen, I will leave this company if you don't upskill me, if you don't let me be the best version I am, right? And we're seeing that trend now, like marketers. 
In theory, marketers should be like, listen, if you're not investing me with these tools and resources, I'm leaving. Because they know they won't be valuable in the, even this job market. So I think, but that's a different mind shift, right? That's not the CEO saying we need to go in this direction. That's bottom up that needs to be built. So I love your analogy about the table, but that table is becoming very, how do I say politically, but it's just old minded, right? It's, it's, they need upskill. Yeah. Katrina? Yeah, I, I would just change the tone. So if I would start a company now, today, I would put in the field multimodal people. So the best launches I've ever seen throughout my journey in pharma are launches in which people in the field are not siloed. So it's a single point of contact. It's like a field entrepreneur. I know a lot of people don't like this word. Someone who can actually solve the problem, the issue of whatever is the customer. And again, in Europe, customers are not only HCPs, many, many, many other decision points. So someone who can speak a bit the language of science, who understands business, who can negotiate. So multimodal people. These are not very, this is a huge skill set. There are not a lot of people doing this, but when you find one of these, I will hold on and grab this person, because this is the person I would like to have working for me and launching a brand. And the second one, I would hire really, really good digital competencies for two things. One, really help me on the customer tailorization and journey. And this means not only grabbing information, but making sense of the information we are grabbing and helping me with the plans. And this is, again, being provocative, I've not seen a lot of these. That really, it's the, the total, total customer journey, right? So what should I do next with this customer so he can move on, right? A, a, on the journey in, in the sense that I, that I feel it's important. And the second one is especially for some disease areas like rare diseases, technology is super needed to find patients. Mm. Patients are, sk sk I mean, they are all over the place. We don't know where they are, especially in large countries like the US when there is a lot of decentralization and health insurance going on and a lot of data protection. So it's very difficult to find patients. So I would also put technology really to help us find the patients where these patients are and try to bring them into a healthcare system environment where I can actually help them. That's a good point. Yeah. So if you start the biotech, let us know we can buy these three stuff. things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I know you're from Novartis, but thank you for praising the new Roche model. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we take questions. We can reserve like one Don't minute for time. questions. Uh, any questions from the audience? The first is the toughest one, as we all know. There is one there. Okay. Question? Mike's behind you. It's coming. Thanks so much. Um, thank you all, like really interesting points. Um, I really like the idea of the, you know, the, the defined specific culture and thinking about a single focus team. Katrina, I think that you said it really well about having people who are really clear on strategy, and, you know, like a single person who knows all the functions well. I was just wondering if maybe, you know, is, is the table kind of getting too big now? Like from my experience, I work in an agency, so I work with lots of marketeers and medics. And often each team has completely different goals, completely different values. They, they're launching different communications. Um, they often argue sales even with, with marketing about their purpose and their goals. And, and I was wondering, you know, is any company gonna, do you think, um, completely change this model and decide, you know, we are all one commercial team, maybe think about combining those teams together and have just a more clearly defined strategy for engaging with customers instead of having them have so many different touch points with, with different people, with different goals. I don't know if, it, if, you, if you think that things are going to change at some point or you have ideas about how that could happen. Sorry, a bit of a long-winded question, but <laughs> if it makes sense. <laughs> Who would like to go? <laughs> well, so I, I can t take a step at it. I think, for, personally for me, the table can never be too big. I think the more people you involve, the more people feel engaged in your company. So I do not like small tables and small groups that sit and define what is the right thing to do. I think it's all about the communication to the organization about what is the vision, what is the purpose, what is the direction you're going in. Because then that large table can wake up every single morning, they know exactly what role they play, and then they will do their job to make sure that we reach that purpose and reach that, that mission. But 
That's my personality, to have the biggest possible table with the most possible amazing people around it. And I know not everybody necessarily agree on that. Yeah, I actually disagree with that. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> that's a very Danish way of putting it. <laughs> David, would you like to sit here? No. no. no this is very right. simply, right, to, to kind of point there. Yes, but everyone needs to have a similar direction and way how they measure success. And that's the issue. You have multiple people sitting at the table that have different versions of what success looks like. And at the end of the day, the patient doesn't get what they need because of that, right? Because of our internal bureaucracy and things such as that. So, this yes. This is not an argument, and, right? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, But back to your model piece, there is a lot of, and it's not just Roche, right? There's a lot of companies that have taken that bold stance of really focusing on their people and single points of contact to really mm -hmm. walk into that ecosystem with a team behind them, right? So, you know, outside of this, I encourage you to have some conversations with the Santa Fe, Roches of the world, et cetera, because we are taking those steps to really say, how can we add value to the ecosystem? And we know it's not just hiring thousands of sales reps, medical teams, and all that, because that model's dead, guys. The static, the, you know, statistics show that. Okay. So I don't disagree. Would you also like <laughs> to build on that, or <laughs> can we take another question from the audience? Let's take let's another take question, another and question. then we can address this too. Any further questions? No? So then, thanks a lot. We are adjourned. It was Thank a great you. discussion. Thank you.